And welcome to News Conference Extra, a special segment of Today in L.A. Weekend. Well, the people have spoken. And here in California, well, this is a state that voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the Democratic ticket for president and vice president of the United States. But there was no blue wave, not across the nation and not here as well. And it surprised quite a few folks, including plenty of Democrats. With us is Jessica Levinson, who teaches election law at Loyola Law School, and Dan Schnur, who teaches politics at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Southern California. He also teaches at UC Berkeley. So, uh, Jessica, first to you. Last night, an emotional moment, certainly, when Joe Biden and Kamala Harris declared victory before supporters, the fireworks, uh, inspirational addresses. But at the same time, the White House is saying, starting tomorrow, their legal team, on behalf of President Trump, is going to try to invalidate the certification of the vote. I guess from Pennsylvania, maybe from Nevada. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, what do you make of this? Uh, well, I think the president's going nowhere. I mean, I think that this is a political argument that he's trying to back up with legal filings, but I don't think that this is going to be a successful one. And as you said, you know, when it comes to whether or not you can get to the Supreme Court, you have to have a federal legal issue at play. And I know that it was very important to President Trump that he have Justice Barrett on the court in case there was post-election litigation. I don't see that litigation reaching the Supreme Court. And even if it did, I don't see that litigation affecting the outcome of the election. Uh, Dan, what happened to the blue wave? I think, first of, all, first of all, there's no question that below the level of the presidential campaign, it was a bad election for Democrats. They did expect a majority in the Senate. They expected to expand their majority in the House. They expected to do much better in state legislatures around the country. There was a fascinating meeting on Thursday of the House Democratic Caucus in which the centrists and progressives really went at each other very harshly. A lot of the more moderate Democratic members of the House, both those who were reelected and some who weren't, were very, very angry because they, they felt that some of the louder progressive voices in the caucus, talking about things like the Green New Deal, talking about defunding the police, that that type of conversation took support that centrist Democrats needed in more competitive, in more competitive districts. Um, this is what happens in a two-party system. Parties don't march in unison. But one of the greatest challenges, if Biden does maintain his current lead and become president, is he's going to have to find a way to convince the progressive base of his party to bite their tongues a little bit longer than they would like to in order to give him a chance to try to forge some semblance of a bipartisan consensus. And it doesn't appear that they're going to be all that eager to do so. Uh, Jessica, uh, great big blue state of California voted to keep, uh, to, to re maintain the ban on affirmative action. Uh, so affirmative action was on the ballot, and California voters, the same ones who voted overwhelmingly for Joe Biden, said, no, we don't want affirmative action. There was an effort to uh, return the pre-Prop 13 tax levels to commercial property. And those same Democrats said, no, we're going to keep Prop 13 the way it is. It, it, navigate that for us. I, I will try to. So I think it's a little bit blunt force. And Conan, you know California politics better than anybody, but it's a little blunt force to say that, well, blue California and the idea that we will always vote very in terms of the progressive wing of the, you know, the Democratic Party. Now, think about that we are also the state that not that long ago said marriage is between a man and a woman. We're also the state that said, no, we are not going to ban the death penalty. We're the state, of course, that banned affirmative action in the first place. You know, with respect to the tax proposition, I still do think that Proposition 13, of course, that ushered in the anti-tax revolution, that still clearly is the third rail in California. And I think people were worried uh, both on the right and the left about the consequences of changing that law, the consequences of passing that law. Uh, people on the left were worried that if taxes increase for landlords, then taxes would increase for tenants. People on the right were worried that taxes would increase, period. When it comes to affirmative action, I think a couple of things were at play. 
One, that tends to be something where people might feel differently in private behind a secret ballot uh, than they might in public when they're talking about it. And I also think there was a little bit of confusion as to whether it would require affirmative action or just permit affirmative action. So I think those are some of the factors at play. If Dan? If I can add on to that, Conan, first of all, it is worth noting, as Jessica suggested, California is a blue state. California is a deep blue state. What we were reminded of on Tuesday is that California is not an indigo state. So it is very progressive, but not to an unlimited degree. On Proposition 16, the Affirmative Action Initiative, I'd offer you two thoughts. Number one, the millennial voters and Generation Z voters, who are by far the most progressive in this electorate, anybody who's under the age of 40 might not know what affirmative action is simply because it hasn't been a fact of law in California for a quarter of a century now. But second, if you think back to the protests, to the rallies, to the demonstrations that took place last spring and summer in the aftermath of the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, those young people, those people of all ages, were marching for racial and social justice on a very broad, very ambitious scale. It's worth noting that not that many people apply to the University of California every year. It's worth noting that not that many people apply for government contracts in California every year. And so for the vast majority of Californians who may have demonstrated in the spring, I wonder if Proposition 16 was seen as symbolic at best and just not that relevant to their lives at worst. Uh, and finally, uh, for bonus uh, points, uh, Jessica, uh, give us your three top candidates to take Kamala Harris's place uh, in the United States Senate. Uh, the governor of California has to make a decision. Uh, so I think it's either going to be Alex Padilla, potentially Alex Padilla, or Alex Padilla. So, so I say that in part because I think that there's a close relationship between Alex Padilla and Gavin Newsom. I think that Alex Padilla was an early supporter, and I think Gavin Newsom likes historic firsts, and I think Gavin Newsom wants to put his mark on this, and he wants to say, I am the person who nominated and appointed the first Latino senator from California, and it... Padilla is young. Gavin Newsom could have some influence just indirectly on this for a very long time. I think that's the pick that makes sense for Gavin Newsom. Dan? I'll make you one prediction that Newsom is about as likely to appoint a white male to that Senate seat as I am to start at center for the Lakers this December. Dan Schnur of the University of Southern California, Jessica Levinson of Loyola Law School. It's so nice to see you uh, post-decision uh, 2020. And uh, still uh, lots to talk about going forward. Thank you very much and stay safe. Thank you, Conan. Thank you.